Shannon O'Brien was the first woman state treasurer of the state of Massachusetts and formerly Democratic nominee for governor. You were elected to office for the first time in 1986. 30 years later, what has changed in how we vote? Well, back in 1986, it was incredibly labor intensive. Everything was done on paper. Uh, you know, getting phone numbers so that you could reach out to voters was a, an incredibly labor intensive process. Uh, getting absentee ballots, again, took time and had a lot of rules and regulations about how you actually got those absentee ballots uh, into the, the, the town clerk's office. And so back then, it took a lot of human beings to make this happen. And then over the years, you know, it, it obviously uh, became a little bit more uh, easy to manage a campaign itself, reaching out to voters and, and, and getting people to the polls, uh, using the internet uh, a little bit easier to, to track people and to, to reach out to them. Uh, so a lot has changed over the years, but now uh, as we're seeing that as technology and, and, and different uh, issues are, are coming to the forefront, uh, we have a lot of people thinking that it's an important time to go back to those days where it's just all paper. And I can give you one interesting example from 1986. I was a highly organized uh, community uh, you know, activist who had a lot of friends, a lot of people working on the campaign. I won my, my four-way primary by 100 votes, not a landslide. But I brought in about 100 absentee ballots, again, which was a major feat getting out there, speaking to families members, making sure that people understood what the process was and explaining it to them. So that literally was the line of, of my, my victory was bringing in those absentee ballots. But it is a lot of work. So I think it's sort of fascinating that you see a lot of people now calling for harking back to paper ballots. Uh, and I sort of shudder when I think about what that was like back in 1986. In 2000, we were introduced to hanging chads. Uh, today, we're back to talking about paper ballots. Kevin Roos from the New York Times says that he's decided that Americans should vote by etching our preferred candidate's name into a stone tablet with a hammer and chisel. I think he's kidding. What do you think about the evolution and thought and the perception? Why is it that people feel this way? Well, obviously, everyone is concerned about the possibility for uh, compromise or hacking. I mean, I, you know, was working on the campaign back with the hanging chads, and we had something similar in the congressional district um, where I live, something similar uh, in terms of how the paper ballots and the punch system uh, did not work during a, a very uh, heavily uh, attended uh, a congressional race. Um, so, but we have seen over the course of the last, you know, number of years, uh, we've seen the Equifax hack. We saw in 2016 uh, that the Russians had attempted to, at least in 21 states, attempt to hack the voting machines uh, in, in different jurisdictions there. So I think that there's a heightened concern about technology, whether or not it can be fully secure, and especially whether or not it can be fully secure for such an important right um, as uh, placing your vote and, and uh, expressing your opinion as to who should be leading the, the state or the country. Most people like, like myself these days, we do online banking. I just did my census online. Uh, as an investor, I transfer a lot of money around online. But, but today we're hearing people say that mail-in ballots are really the only option. Um, it seems crazy to me, but what do you think? Are there barriers uh, to mail-in ballots that people generally miss? Uh, are states willing to bear the cost uh, when we need money in other places? Are we justified in investing our resources here? Paper ballots are not hackable but they are not infallible. We've seen, I think in this country, in the last election, the last presidential election, uh, over 400,000 absentee ballots either didn't make it to get counted, were rejected because the signature on the ballot did not m match a, a signature you know, within the clerk's office. So paper ballots, while the putting pen or pencil to paper and getting that done, is not hackable, the process between getting that vote from your home or uh, your office or wherever you're gonna be actually filling out the, the ballot and getting it in and actually having it counted, there are many of potential pitfalls uh, that can happen. And we saw this just this past week uh, in Wisconsin where you know there, there were so many people who needed to send in uh, absentee ballots because 
workers concerned about the coronavirus did not want to show up and man the polls. And so I think they had something like one-tenth the number of in-person uh, balloting uh, locations, so people had to wait hours and hours. Uh, those ballots that, that uh, you know, did not get in on time, they will not be counted. And one of the points that I have always made, because, you know, the sort of two sides of the coin is we want to make sure that we have accessibility, that as many people who want to vote will have their votes counted, and we want to have security. But the difference for me is the, the security issue and whether or not there's voter fraud is certainly something that you'll hear, you know, on one side of the aisle. Voter fraud is a big problem. Uh, and that is a problem. If, if I vote and I place my vote and someone who is inappropriately voting votes, they in essence dilute my vote. But those people in Wisconsin or those 400,000 people whose absentee ballots didn't count in the last cycle, their vote doesn't get diluted, their vote gets stolen. And so for me, accessibility, if I have to determine between security and voter fraud and, and accessibility, I'm going to tip the scales in terms of accessibility, but I still think there is a way that you can do both. And I believe that there is a way that you can balance many of the concerns that different people have right now um, and, and do it in a way that's reasonable, that protects both the ability to access and, and have an opportunity to vote, but also promotes uh, security and, and reduces voter fraud. So you hear you talking about security and access, and I've been thinking about both of those things in this context. Kind of and balancing act, if you will, in, in many yeah. people's minds. The security, you know, we, we've solved it with people moving, you know, billions of dollars a day online through bank accounts that everybody's very worried about. A access is the really interesting one. And I've noticed, you know, with so many people working from home now, uh, one of the things that, that you see is that people with mobility issues or those that are immunocompromised, you know, they could have been doing these jobs and had an equal seat at the table all along in this environment. So I'm certain that with coronavirus changing how we do business, you know, some government services, maybe licenses and IDs will move online. But what are the practical barriers to elections moving online? Well, I think that the practical barrier is that you do have some people who really don't think that enhancing accessibility is a good thing. And we literally heard the president saying within the past week uh, that he did not want to uh, improve access to voting because he thought it would uh, undermine, you know, the the the, the electability of, of people who you know think or, or or act the way he does, and 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 that I think is problematic. But the real issue is is I think right now going to be cost. Um, you know, we saw that in the the the, the stimulus package, approximately four hundred million was was put into that bill to help uh, make sure that people can get to the polls. Uh, in during this coronavirus crisis. So it's going to cost money, but it's also going to require a, a, a meeting of the minds between the left and the right, the Republicans and the Democrats, that they agree that making sure that voter access, especially during this just unusual pandemic crisis we're having right now, uh, is important. Um, and we have seen since uh, the Supreme Court has gutted uh, a significant portion of the Voter Rights Act that was first passed uh, during the 1960s. Um, we have seen additional barriers being put up so that people uh, have a harder time accessing their right to vote. So I think that, and I don't know if this can happen, but I think that the most important thing toward making voting more accessible is to understand that making voting more accessible is an important civil and constitutional right that we all have. Sounds reasonable to me. Um, you've sort of answered this one. I'm going I'm to ask it again in case you have anything else to add. Um, what are the political challenges associated with modernizing the voting process? The political challenges are that right now you don't have everyone in agreement about what the best process is for both securing the vote and making voting accessible. And I think that the most important thing that can happen is to take some very measured and rational steps towards testing some new technologies. But the fact is, you had people who weren't trained. You had new rules that were brought to bear during those Iowa caucuses. So there were many things beyond the technology that made the Iowa caucuses a failure. And so understanding that any new technology, even going to uh, 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 mail-in ballots, there will be issues and problems that have to be dealt with. And so it's making sure that we understand that whatever we do, 
this is not going to be a quick fix and has to be part of a longer process moving us forward where we can both use technology and maybe old-fashioned technology uh, to increase both accessibility and security, but do it in a rational, well-thought-out uh, and hopefully bipartisan way. What needs to be done to make the changes necessary to improve access? What, if, what would you do uh, if you could wave your magic wand? I am a believer in taking a look at uh, mobile voting platforms, uh, looking at ways that we can enhance uh, both the accessibility but also uh, the auditability because there are many voting machines out there that count the paper ballots that we cannot subject them to simple uh, audits. So making sure that we understand that we can use technology to make these improvements. And so I think it's just you know, understanding that we're going to be able to use technology, that we need to do it in a number of different facets that, that can help us as a, as, a, as a state, as a nation. Uh, and so moving in that direction, I think, is going to be uh, very, very important for, for all of us as citizens. Shannon, I hear you have a personal story about uh, voting that maybe is relevant to all of this. In 1976, my dad ran for the United States Congress uh, in the post-Watergate uh, era. And it was a year that many people thought a that a Democrat might win the seat. And my father ran against a very well-qualified uh, candidate, uh, Ed McColgan. And the primary, uh, he won by something like 12 votes. And then during the recount process, there were votes that went back and forth, and he ended up losing by four votes. I think it was the closest congressional vote in the history of the state. I think it still remains. But the real issue was, and this is the problem with, with um, paper ballots, is that you can't change paper ballots because they need to be printed. They need to be sent out. And so the problem that my father faced is that he actually thought he might be able to go to court and successfully challenge the outcome of that, that recount, but he couldn't go to court because even if he won the court case, there would not have been enough time to print his name on the ballot. So he gracefully, you know, uh, uh, st st stepped back. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people thought that my dad actually won that primary. So it was one of those things that you understand the inflexibility of, of a paper ballot. Someone goes and they vote for Pete Buttigieg, he drops out, or Bernie Sanders, he drops out. They're not on the ballot anymore. And if you've already voted, you don't get an opportunity to quickly or easily change your vote. Shannon O'Brien, thank you for your service to our country and great talking to you. Thanks very much. Nice talking to you as well.